This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. We live in a world that is beset by what some have called angel mania. Did you know that there are about 24 million internet searches each month around the world looking for information about angels? In addition, there have been hundreds of books, documentaries, movies, articles, websites, and television shows devoted to the subject of angels. Sadly, there is too much misinformation and false doctrine on the subject, and there has been too little sound biblical teaching on angels. In 1994, Time Magazine released a survey where they discovered that 69% of Americans believe in angels, 46% believe they have a guardian angel, and 32% believe they have had a personal encounter with an angel. Now that tells me we have a lot of work to do in the Lord's church teaching the truth on angels. When was the last time you heard a sermon or a Bible class on angels? Did you know there are over 300 references to angels in the Bible? About half of them in the Old Testament and half of them in the New Testament. Let us debunk some of these false doctrines that are popularly taught about angels. Let's ask this question. What does an angel look like? If you closed your eyes and conjured up the image of an angel in your mind, what would you see? Would you see perhaps a beautiful woman with wings and a halo? Maybe you see an adorable little cherub floating on a crowd. Someone might else, else might say, no, no, what I see is an angelic choir singing and strumming their harps. Well, in the Bible, the fact of the matter is that angels never appear as women or children. They never have harps or halos. They are said to sing only one time in Job 38 verse 7 where God asked Job where he was when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. In the book of Job, angels are called the sons of God. In the Bible, angels only have wings in artwork or visions. They normally appear as young men wearing shining white garments. Consider, for example, Luke chapter 24 and verse 4, which is typical. At the empty tomb, the Bible says, And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. That's typically the way angels are portrayed in the Bible in historical texts meant to be read literally. Let's consider another question concerning angels. Do angels still bring messages from God today? The word angel, after all, means a messenger. And they are often portrayed in the Bible as delivering messages from heaven to earth. Do they still do this today? The answer from the Bible is no. In Jude verse 3, we are told to contend earnestly for the faith, for the word of God, once for all delivered to the saints. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, the Apostle Paul said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Likewise, 2 Peter 2, 1 verse 3 tells us that in the Scriptures we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. In the Bible, in other words, we have a complete and sufficient revelation of the mind of God. It tells us everything we need to know to be saved and stay saved. Now, from this, we conclude then that there is nothing left for an angel to reveal. No message is left for them to deliver. If, in fact, the Bible is sufficient, then we do not need modern-day revelation beyond its pages. In fact, in Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9, angels are forbidden to change the gospel lest they incur the judgment of God. Paul wrote, But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. 
The truth is that false claims of angelic revelation are nothing new. In 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 18, we read this, He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But then the text says, He was lying to him. Now friends and brethren, this is not merely an academic debate. The truth of the matter is that false doctrine always has harmful consequences. And I want to give you some examples where alleged angelic revelations are concerned. I want you to consider, for example, the so-called prophet Muhammad, who lived in Arabia in the 6th century A.D. He claimed that while he was meditating in a cave, the angel Gabriel appeared to him with the first of many revelations that ultimately became the Islamic holy book, the Quran. Think for a moment about the rivers of blood that have been shed, the many people that have been injured and killed because of these false claims of angelic revelation. And friends, it goes down till this very day to the World Trade Center attacks perpetrated by Muslim extremists. Let me give you a second example. In 1820, a man named Joseph Smith Jr. claimed that an angel by the name of Moroni, an angel, by the way, nowhere mentioned in the Bible, appeared to him and showed him where he could find golden tablets that he allegedly translated by the power of God and that ultimately became the Book of Mormon. Well, once again, how many souls have been endangered by the false doctrine taught by Mormonism? How many people have been hurt and killed because of the false tenets of Mormonism? Mormonism, like Islam, has a long and bloody history, and we trace these back directly to the false claims of angelic revelation that has arisen over the years. Furthermore, are we supposed to believe that God is revealing contradictory messages to the Catholics and Protestants and Evangelicals, Pentecostals, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and New Agers, all of whom are writing books claiming that God revealed such and such a message to them through an angel. Friends, that simply defies logic and common sense. Now let's consider another question. Do you have a guardian angel? You might remember that earlier in this lesson we noted that 46%, almost half of the American people believe they have a guardian angel. But in reality, the Bible says no. The Bible does teach there are angels who guard God's children, but not guardian angels. Consider, for example, Daniel's rescue from the lion's den in Daniel 6, verses 20 to 22, by an angel. Or the, the apostles in Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 21, who were rescued from prison in Jerusalem by an angel. So there are angels who guard, but not guardian angels. Now someone might say, well, what's the difference? Let's define our terms. The doctrine of guardian angels says that God assigns an angel to people to guide, guard, and direct them separate and apart from the Scriptures. Catholics believe that every person, good or bad, has a guardian angel. Protestants believe that only children and Christians have guardian angels. Muslims believe that two angels follow you around wherever you go, one recording your good deeds and the other recording your bad deeds. On the day of judgment, these two angels make their report to Allah, and if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, then you're admitted into heaven. Otherwise, you're banished to hell. There is a version of the guardian angel doctrine that appears in Judaism and Hinduism, and even we in Churches of Christ have debated this issue. Some older scholars in the Restoration Movement believed in a form of the guardian angel doctrine. They believed that God assigned angels to watch over people, but they rejected the idea that they provided any direct guidance separate from the Scriptures. This would include uh, very well-known writers and preachers such as Alexander Campbell, J.W. McGarvey, B.W. Johnson, or in our own day, Brother Charles Hodge. Liberal writers among us today, however, such as Joe Beam and his book, Seeing the Unseen, accept the sectarian view of guardian angels that they do indeed offer guidance separate and apart from the Scriptures. Now let's consider some logical and biblical objections to the doctrine of guardian angels. First, 
it is unreasonable. If it is the case that every person or every believer or every child has a guardian angel, why would anyone get hurt or sick or die? The truth of the matter is that in the Bible, angels never fail in the task God has assigned to them. If someone gets hurt, did their guardian angel fail? That's an unreasonable view. It is also unbiblical. There, are no, there is no clear scriptural support for the doctrine of guardian angels, and its advocates admit this. I want you to consider this quote from a website called AmericanCatholic.org, an article written in 2010. They said, the concept of an angel assigned to guard and nurture each human being is a development of Catholic doctrine and piety based on Scripture, but not directly drawn from it. There are some passages in the Bible that are taken out of proof, out of context to attempt to prove the doctrine of guardian angels, but it is a fruitless effort. Another objection, it violates human free will. How can we be truly free, as the Bible teaches, if we are being constantly, subconsciously manipulated by angels and demons? Well, we simply would not be free. In the next place, it is a self-contradictory doctrine. Its advocates claim to believe in human free will, but as we just noted, their doctrine implicitly denies it. And finally, it impugns the sufficiency of Scripture. And again, its advocates admit that the need for a guardian angel is seen because the Bible is not enough. One Catholic scholar named Raymond Rigami said this, The rule of law is too abstract, by which he means the Bible. In his imaginations, amid passions which are in danger of surprising him, God, by means of an angel, introduces images and tendencies leading him to do what is right. Why do you need the help of a guardian angel? Because Scripture is not enough to tell you what to do to go to heaven. Friends, that's simply false. To the extent that people believe they are being guided and directed by guardian angels, to that same extent they will ignore what God has really said, what His angels have really said in the Bible. And souls will be jeopardized by such neglect of the Word of God. Now let's consider another question. Do angels miraculously appear to people today? Many say yes. And many books have been written allegedly documenting these close encounters of the celestial kind. But again, the Bible says no. Now, Scripture certainly teaches that angels did many supernatural things in Bible times, but this is not happening today. Again, it's important we define our terms. The word miracle gets thrown around rather loosely. If someone finds a good parking place at Walmart, they're liable to say, it's a miracle. A baby being born is often said to be a miracle. But the truth of the matter is, as the Bible uses the word miracle, that's not what, in fact what they are. A miracle, according to the Bible, is a supernatural act that only God can perform. Something natural law operating on its own cannot do. Now, examples from the Bible would include things like Moses parting the Red Sea, the prophets or the apostles or Jesus Himself raising the dead. When our Lord walked on the stormy waters of the Sea of Galilee, that was a miracle. Gravity was being defied. When He stilled raging storms with but a word or two, that's a miracle. When the Lord and His apostles laid their hands upon someone or simply spoke a word and they fully, completely, totally healed someone who had been sick for many, many years, that is a miracle. Now consider some objections to these claims of modern-day angelic miracles and appearances. In the first place, all modern-day claims are simply unverifiable. In the second place, angelic visits in the Bible are much rarer than those reported today. We're reading cases where hundreds of angels are said to appear to people today. But in the Bible, angelic appearances are relatively rare. Now consider one example. The first time angels appear in the Bible are in Genesis 3 verse 24 where a cherubim is assigned by God to prevent Adam and Eve from returning to the Garden of Eden. The next time they appear is in Genesis chapter 18 verses 1 and 2 when God along with two angels in human form appeared to Abraham and Sarah. Now consider this fact. 
between Adam and Abraham, according to biblical chronology, about 2,000 years of history passed. And yet we have two angelic appearances in that time. Now I'm not suggesting that the angels were doing nothing else during those two millennia, simply that there is a great deal of time between these two, these first two recorded angelic appearances. And that simply does not line up with what we're being told today. In the second place, angelic visits are far different from those commonly reported today. Today, when people encounter an angel, they talk about what a loving thing it was, how good they felt, how warm they felt. Whereas in the Bible, people were frightened to death and many fainted when angels showed up. So awesome and glorious was their appearance. Almost invariably, as in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, for example, the first thing the angels had to say to people was, do not be afraid. And so we see again another discrepancy between what the Bible teaches on angels and these alleged modern day appearances. But also very important to understand is that according to the New Testament, according to the Bible as a whole, miracles were temporary and ceased with the end of the apostolic age. That is by the end of the first century. Now how do we know that? Because the Bible teaches that miracles were for the purpose of revealing and confirming the Scriptures. And there are a number of passages which teach this, but for time's sake consider this passage in Mark 16 verses 17 through 20. After giving the Great Commission, Jesus said, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Now our Pentecostal friends typically stop reading right there and cite this as proof of modern day miracles. But if they'd kept reading, they would have realized their mistake. Mark goes on to write, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, notice it please, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs, amen. The truth of the matter is, is that many have claimed to be prophets of God over the years. What is the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet? A true prophet has supernatural credentials. He can perform signs and wonders that prove he is truly speaking the word of God. False prophet cannot do that. Now, in the second place, we need to realize then that the Bible has been fully revealed and fully confirmed. Again, remember the words of Jude verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, for the word of God, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Likewise, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the New Testament reads, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. The Scriptures have been miraculously revealed. They have been miraculously confirmed. Their purpose has been fulfilled, and thus they are no longer needed in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13, the Apostle Paul predicted that signs and wonders would come to an end when God's all-sufficient Word was completed. Miracles are a lot like scaffolding. You know when you're in the process of building a building, a high-rise building in particular. The workman needs scaffolding in order to complete the building. But when the building is finished, do they leave the scaffolding up? No, indeed. They take them down and put them away. Scaffolding is a temporary tool, just like miracles had a temporary purpose. They were the supernatural scaffolding that God used to reveal and confirm His Word. But once it was fully revealed and fully confirmed, the miracles, like the scaffolding, were put away. I want you to consider this interesting quote from a, the respected church historian Samuel Green. He wrote, when we emerge in the second century, we are to a great extent in a changed world. Apostolic authority lives no longer in the Christian community. Apostolic miracles have passed. 
We cannot doubt that there was a divine purpose in thus marking off the age of inspiration and of miracles by so broad and definite a boundary from succeeding times. Friends, the truth of the matter is, is that no one has seen an angel miraculously since the end of the apostolic age. Again, are we to believe that God's angels are miraculously confirming the contradictory doctrines of Catholics and Protestants and Pentecostals and Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jews, Hindus, and New Agers, all of whom are claiming that they've encountered angels and that angels have performed miracles in their lives? Now let's consider yet another question about angels. Namely, should angels be worshipped? Many in our world today do worship them. Consider, for example, the practice of our Roman Catholic friends. On October the 2nd, they celebrate the Feast of the Guardian Angels. And on September 27th, they have a feast day in honor of the archangels Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael. Now in the Bible, only Michael is identified as an archangel. Gabriel is never given that title, and of course it knows nothing of an angel named Raphael at all. That again is Catholic doctrine. Catholic children are taught a prayer to their guardian angel, and it goes like this. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard and rule and guide. Amen. Now our Catholic friends try to dodge the charge of idolatry by saying that they venerate the angels and the saints and Mary and the Pope while they reserve their worship for God alone. But this is simply a distinction without a difference. Any dictionary or thesaurus will show you that the words veneration and worship are synonyms. In other words, they mean the same thing. Our New Age friends make gods out of angels. And they even have their own angel churches where they worship them. For example, in Carmel, California, there is the first church of the angels. The truth is, is that Scripture explicitly condemns the worship of angels. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 10 and again in Revelation 22 verses 8 and 9, the Apostle John, overcome with the visions he was shown, tried to worship an angel and twice he was rebuked for it, told not to do it and to worship God alone. In Colossians 2 verse 18, the Apostle Paul wrote, Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. No, friends, angels should not be worshipped or venerated in any sense. Now let's consider one final question. Is Jesus Christ really Michael the archangel? Jehovah's Witnesses teach this, as well as do other cultic groups who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. They teach He was a created being, and so equate Him with Michael. The truth is, is that Michael the archangel is mentioned five times in the Bible. In Daniel chapter 10, verses 13 and 20, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, in Jude verse 9, and in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. In none of these verses, or anywhere else in the Bible for that matter, is he identified as the Son of God. Our Jehovah's Witness friends, however, argue that since Jesus and Michael share certain attributes, they must be identical, but such reasoning is invalid. My dog Lucky, for example, has two ears and a tail. My cat Selena also has two ears and a tail. But my cat is not my dog, and my dog is not my cat. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 14 clearly shows that Jesus Christ is not an angel. Consider Hebrews 1 verse 4 in particular, where it is said of Christ, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. No, Jesus Christ is not an angel, not Michael, nor any other. He is their creator, they are his servants. Now angels certainly do have a role to play in our lives today. In Hebrews chapter 1 verse 14, the inspired writer asked this question of angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation?